Intel wants to charge us how much? Tesla has to roll back one of their full self-driving softwares. And Max, are you ready to take your Max M1 Max Max to the Max? Let's get into the hot news, everybody. I'm your host. <laughs> Brett. <laughs> I'm your Brett host. We're gonna be going over the hottest tech news that I can find on this very here internet. I am getting over a cough from this past weekend. I hope you enjoyed your weekend. That's <laughs> Sorry. All right, I'm gonna try to get through this without coughing anymore. That's the reason why I didn't come out with comment response yesterday is because <clears throat> I'm still trying to get through this. Hopefully it doesn't inconvenience the rest of this episode. It's not COVID, <clears throat> I know that much. We now have some indication about how much Intel's going to be charging for their upcoming Intel Arc GPUs based on some giveaway details that they had. They held this teaser microarchitecture giveaway over on their Twitter page where they then teased the actual price of this based on the uh, you know prizes being awarded to the winners below. And it does seem to indicate that the highest end version of Intel's Arc GPU is gonna be somewhere in the $900 region, whereas the more bottom tier or high end ones is gonna be around $650. So that's 650 for the performance, 825 for the premium model, which we again, don't really have a whole lot of details directly from Intel themselves about what these are gonna be performing like. But I wanna ask you, where does the performance of these cards have to lie in order for you to be willing to pay $650 for their like high-end one and then 825 for their premium mega daddy Mac chip flagship Max Max. Because coming in at gaming performance around a 6800 XT and an RTX 3080 is good for $650, but with the lack of driver support and lack of things like NVENC encoding, it's hard to see it being worth that much. I would think it'd have to be closer to a 3080 Ti level in performance as just pure gaming rasterization in order for that to be reasonable. And for the 825, that would probably have to be closer to the 6900 XT. That would just be my guess for people to actually go out and want to adopt these GPUs at these prices, or it doesn't really matter because the pound is empty anyways, because everybody's buying the GPUs no matter what, because there's a shortage and they can scalp them for whatever. So it doesn't matter what people want to pay for them. It's, it's a whole wholly irrelevant conversation right now. But in an ideal world, what level of performance would you be willing to get in order to compensate for these dollar figures? Let me hear from you down below in the comments. But if you think Intel's GPUs are expensive, DDR5 is also likely gonna be expensive. If you want an all Intel system of the next gen, Alder Lake plus Arc plus all of that, it's gonna be a crap ton with MSI indicating that a DDR5 might be a huge 50 to 60% price premium compared to DDR4 at launch. And on top of the fact that latency is also likely to be worse than DDR4 at launch, this is gonna be a very difficult persuasion to get people to switch over to this brand new architecture that Intel's trying to be bringing out. AMD at least has their 3D V cache that's coming out in Q1 and they will only be moving us along to the next generation of DDR5 in about a year, which probably by then there might be a little bit of price decrease, but Intel uh, might just have to be expensive on all fronts, but they're not being uh, liquidated of cash. That's not the right phrasing that I'm trying to go for. Their takeover of Sci-5 has fell through. According to Bloomberg's latest report, they initially reported that Intel was in talks to buy out Sci-5, and now it looks like Sci-5 is not going forward with that deal and instead pursuing an IPO route. So Intel is not getting their greedy little fingers on everything else. They're gonna have to invent things, like real inventors, like my man, Inspector Gadget. Inspector Gadget. Go, go, Gadget Pentium. What joke was that? That's not a good joke. And you know what else isn't a good joke? Cryptocurrency. Let's get into the crypto stonks update. Bitcoin up slightly at 1.64% up on the day to be at $62,000 as of the time of recording. Ethereum up mildly 0.15% to be at 41.35. And Dogecoin up 10 percent look at that bad boy climb 27 cents dogecoin is this the resurgening is this the resurgence is this the second coming of dogecoin is it gonna hit a dollar finally we'll find out i doubt there's gonna be vigor for the meme like there was last time unless people really want to buy back into the whole you know dogecoin to a dollar meme gamestop down 6.5 percent on flight friday to close in at 169.80 amc down 6.7 percent to close at 36.60 not a good day for for the meme stonks whatsoever and not a good day for tesla on friday because they had to roll back one of their full self-driving beta softwares due to people saying that there were false crash warnings as well as other bugs being implemented
implemented in this FSD beta. Elon Musk tweeting out that they're rolling back to 10.2, which also means that the people who have the safety score have to wait a little while longer because they are not rolling it out to a new batch of people. But Elon Musk saying, please note that this is to be expected with beta software. It's impossible to test all hardware configs in all conditions with internal QA, hence public beta, which just, you know, the added caveat that a public beta involves multi-ton vehicles driving at high rates of speeds towards other people and could potentially lead into some, you know, severe casualties or fatalities. You know, just that little byline of things might be bad if things break. He's not wrong. You can't test this on, on, in mass without testing it in mass. Uh, I don't know if there's a better solution, but uh, it's, a, it's a tricky rollout for the full self-driving beta software to get out to noobs such as myself. My safety score is not 99. I wasn't ready anyways, it's totally fine. But what I am ready for is the next generation of VR headsets and Pimax has announced a partnership with Toby to put eye tracking into future headsets so that you could do things such as better foveated rendering. They could track your eyes, make sure that they're only rendering out the portions that you're looking at, which means you would need less performance or you could get higher fidelity on the things that actually matter and make sure that you're having a much better VR experience overall. This is something that Toby has excelled at with eye tracking. And in fact, Toby makes a whole bunch of stuff that I've recently recently discovered they actually make the, the AAC device that my son uses in order to communicate with us on, on a tablet. So Toby, definitely a maker of good accessibility devices. I want the best for them. And so I'm looking forward to what seeing what Pimax comes out with with this Toby partnership. But Google and Roku's partnership has been on the rocks as of late. We reported in previous episodes of Hot News that Google and Roku were having a bit of a, a tiff, a spat, if you would, about, uh, you know, things such as YouTube or YouTube TV not going on Roku because Roku didn't like the fact that Google is trying to strong arm them into using Google search. Well, Google is like, that's pish posh. That's scallywag nonsense, okay? We don't abide by such conjecture, except for CNBC uh, came out with a report saying that, oh no, Google indeed did ask Roku to have like a dedicated shelf for YouTube search results in Roku's own results. And Roku's just like, we're trying to make this independent and free from Google's nonsense. And we cannot do so because they are trying to bring their nonsense in here. But some Google nonsense that's getting rectified is Google Meets will now have the ability for hosts to mute and turn off the camera of people in the actual participatory meeting, whatever it's called, works office virtual entertainment prelude that goes on. This was not a feature before. I'm surprised that there's a news article about it because this seems like a very basic feature that should have been rolled out a long time ago, especially when we've been in the pandemic for how freaking long Google Meets, my f I'm not even gonna go there, but you, this, while we're talking about antiquated technology that is getting rolled out or rolled up, removed? T-Mobile removing Sprint's 3G network a little later than previously anticipated. Three months is what they're delaying it by to ensure partners have time to help its customers with the transition. This is actually probably based on a spat that Dish Network is having with T-Mobile with regards to how they're shutting down the 3G network. Because in the contract of T-Mobile and Sprint merging together, there was something, if I can recall this, you know what, I'm not even gonna speculate. Anyways, Dish was upset, T-Mobile fixy a little bit. Three months doesn't seem like a whole lot of time to like recuperate a whole network, but I'm, I'm no engineer and I'm no Halo player either. I just, Master Chief, who does he speak in the video games? People told me this, it doesn't matter, all right? The needle gun from Halo is coming to Nerf. You can get a Nerf blaster that's designed exactly like that. You can pre-order it now over on Hasbro Pulse website, the Nerf LMTD Limited Halo Needler, gonna cost you $100 pre-order by December 31st of this year, in case you wanna grab one of those. Speaking of video games, the remastered GTA trilogy, which is gonna include San Andreas, GTA 3, and Vice City is coming out on November 11th. It's gonna cost you $60 and Rockstar putting out a video showing the difference in the two different versions from the original over to the remastered. It actually looks like they put a decent amount of effort into remastering this game. Are you excited for the trilogy? Let me know down below in the comments. And are you excited for Apple's new M1 chips? I know personally I am, even though I have no money to purchase them. I just will be looking at them longingly through the Apple shop window being like, oh man, if only I could have Max in my pocket. Sorry to all my viewers named Max. Anyways, DaVinci Resolve coming out and saying that the M1 Pro and Max will have five times faster 8K editing on the Apple Mac mod, which is just that's five times faster, 8, 8K? Wow, this is good stuff. It's good stuff. Even the software people are saying it's good, but you know who else is saying things are good? Apple. 
Fun fact, if you bought a 14 inch M1 Max, you're an idiot because there's a hidden feature in the 16 inch one known as high powered mode. I don't mean that you're an idiot. I just mean that you bought something without all of the data. Apple now revealing that there will be a high powered mode with not a whole lot of detail as to what it does besides optimized performance, which could mean that they have a more aggressive fan curve. It could have a better power delivery somehow. Anyways, it's not gonna be available on the M1 Pro or the 14 inch model. So if you want to get the most powerful M1 Max, you want to max out your M1 Max, Max. You got to you got to do it with the 16 inch M1 to make it happen. OK, you got to get the 16 inch. Nobody wants 14 inches. It's too small. And I know that the amount of time that we spend together is too small, but alas, I will have to leave it there. <laughs> I will see you tomorrow for another episode of Hot News, my friends, for breakfast. Chip Cheerios. Yo, Leo.